Hey, it's Michelangelo Caruso. I'm here with Patrick Galvin. Hi, Patrick. Hey, Michael. Great to join you. It's great to see you, man. I have a lot of admiration for your work. And in particular, we're going to talk about something that might feel wrong to people. It's this idea of self-interest versus service. It's a, uh, this, this concept that you're hammered home in a great TED Talk. You have a book about it. Before we get started, everybody, uh, I just want to remind you that if you're watching this video on YouTube or in some other format, you can listen to the podcast version on the Talk To Me podcast. It's on all the main platforms, Podbean, iTunes, etc. And if you're listening to the podcast format, please log on to YouTube, get yourself over to the Michelangelo Caruso channel, click that red subscribe button and tap uh, that notification bell so that you're notified of all new content. Patrick, you're back from the road. You just had a cluster of gigs somewhere. Midwest, was it? <laughs> it was kind of a, a jaunt through the, the West and the mountains. So I started in San Francisco, went over to Denver and then wound back up in San Diego. So uh, great to get out of the Zoom box. Yeah, it feels good to be on the road. Uh, they, they haven't quite forgotten about the mass on airplanes yet, unfortunately, but maybe that's coming. I, I, I hear it is. Uh, you know what? I, I don't mind wearing the mask, but it's sure nice not to have to speak with a mask. 100%. I did a gig during COVID. I was just looking at the photo the other day because it's in my phone. I was just scrolling. Uh, it, was a, it was a bank, Premier Bank, if I've got the name right, in South Dakota and uh, Sioux Falls. And uh, I got the I got when I got the gig, um, Sioux Falls hadn't had a hot been a hot spot yet. It wasn't like it's a very unpopulated state, and uh, and then of course it becomes a hot spot as the date gets closer. And when I get there, Patrick, I don't know if you experience this yourself. When I get there, they've got the chairs set up ten feet apart, all over the room. This large, large room. Right. And then the people sat in their chairs by themselves. Some of them sat with like with their hands in their lap with masks on. It felt like a hostage situation. It was so <laughs> creepy. And I took a picture in the front of the room. That's a picture I'm telling you about today. And I, I'm like, is this what my life has come to? Is this what all of our lives have come to? And fortunately, that we're, we're, we're back to some semblance of normality now. You know, not only fortunately, but I'm appreciating audiences now more than I did. I, you know, you take it for granted, anything that you just have and you don't experience going without. So I'm guessing that when you sit before an audience and people are close together, they're not staggered like that. You remember, you're reminded of South Dakota saying, wow, this is so nice. It's not what that was. Yeah. Uh, so I think you have to go without sometimes to appreciate what you have. And I'm sure feeling that way when it comes to speaking. So we have that in common. We have, uh, we have our career in common. Uh, we both work in the training industry keynotes. I think your mix is a little bit different than mine. Um, we both work with our spouses. Now I'm getting ready to get married to the redhead, but you've been married for 20 years. What is your yes. wife's first name? Ellen. Yes. And, uh, and this is a dream that you've had to get your company up and going, the galvanizing group. Is that correct? Yes. We have been together for actually a year long. So we've been married for 20 years. We've been together in business for about 21. And uh, yeah, it, it's wonderful. I get to work with my best friend, a uh, person I can trust. When I talk to other speakers, they're jealous. A couple of them have said, if you ever mistreat her, and these are women speakers saying, I will marry your wife because I need an Ellen in my life. <laughs> so I think we are both lucky. If we can work with our spouses, um, we've got something that others you know, would love to have. Yeah. What's your secret, man? Because it, you end up spending a lot of time with your best friend and even that can be too much time do you have a do you have a breaker switch or some sort of balance mechanism you know i think it's luck honestly um it's fortuitous that we're different have different i'm an extrovert she's more on the introverted side i like being on a stage she would not want to go near one she's really good at making sure we keep the promises i'm really good at making promises so i, I think <laughs> i think the key in business whether it's a wife or just a business partner is not to have someone just like you because then you're like running away from the things that need to get done. Yeah. Uh, but when you've got those opposites, uh, you're able to really offer that holistic thing that, you know, clients deserve. So I think honestly, you know, I could say I did this, I did, that. I got lucky, man. <laughs> it was just really luck that we are just different types of people. I think Renee and I are opposites too. I'm a Leo and she's a Scorpio. Ah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you do training, you do keynotes, you've got you, online courses. Yeah. 
Yeah, we do online courses, exactly. Uh, all around the theme, all of these things you mentioned around the theme of relationship building. How do you build relationships of trust, both internally within your organization, as well as externally with your customers, with the prospects, with the folks who refer business to you? And you've been uh, lucky slash skilled at creating a book series uh, and perhaps other products that are driving business. You have a, a, a series of books. Tell us about that. So I am a parabolist. I like writing stories. So I started writing a nonfiction handbook about business relationship building about seven years ago. Yeah. I got about 10 pages into that book and I was bored. <laughs> that is not a good sign if you're the author or bored of your own content. And then I started thinking, hey, what are the books that I read? So I love Bob Berg. I love Ogmandino. These are parabolists. Patrick Lencioni. There's so much that you can tell by means of a story. So everything I had started to write in a nonfiction format, um, I then translated into a fictional uh, format in my first book, The Connector's Way. Uh, and that's a story about somebody who is not a great relationship builder, who learns through some trial and error and some mentors about a relationship-centric way to grow his business. And there's a big part of autobiography in there. That's kind of my story. Um, I've also cherry-picked from clients we've had over the years. Um, and it's really interesting how people remember story more than facts and figures and how they're more engaged with the content. So I, I think I really found the right way to express myself. So that's why I decided to write a second parable that came out last year, kind of perfecting some things that I didn't cover well enough in the first one on some nuances, a very important nuance to relationship building. But Excellent. yeah, I, li I, li I like writing short books that are stories. We'll get to the titles in just a few minutes, but I wanted um, I wanted that as kind of a background for how you approach things. Parables are are very uh, potent, as are true stories. Uh, Mitch Albom's made a career of it here in Detroit. Um, Tuesdays with Maury, I love that book. That's right. Well, yeah. Maury was based on, of course, a true person, uh, one of his mentors, but a lot yes. of his books past that were parable based. Um, and you know who else did it really well? Ken Blanchard and Spencer Johnson. You know mm -hmm. the "Who Moved My Cheese" and Absolutely. all of that stuff. Yep, but you're right. They've been around a long time, and it's a it's a great way to convey lessons to people. I like too how you've con you've created books that appeal to certain industries. Like you did one just for the insurance industry, right? Yeah, but it's sold a lot more in the mortgage industry. So sometimes you go into it thinking, "I know my audience." And someone in the mortgage industry said, yeah, we just changed it from an insurance agency owner to a mortgage company owner. It's the same thing, the same issues we have. So sometimes you think you know your audience, but then the mortgage people are saying, you know what, it's about relationship building and here's a parable about it. So now, now I'm kind of coming back to insurance. I wrote it thinking that would be my, my go-to, but you know, books are funny. They take you on interesting journeys. Yeah. You wake up tomorrow and you've got one for dental hygienists. It's the same damn book. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? You just... You, the only thing that's certain in life is change. Well, yeah. death and taxes, we all know that. But, you know, people, how they use your stuff, if you just put it out in the universe, good things, if it's good content, good quality, people will be attracted. And sometimes they may surprise you who they are. Yeah, 100%. So a thousand years ago, I was in college and I was introduced by an author, to an author, not personally, but just her work named Ayn Rand. I'm sure you oh, yeah, know Ayn yeah, Rand. Oh, yeah, 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 very famous. Uh, for those of you hearing the name for the first time, it's A-Y-N. She was Russian or Russian-based. English was actually her second language. And she wrote these magnificent, fictional, parabolic, if that's a word. They were based on parables, maybe. But most, most importantly, they, they revolved around something she called ob objectivism. It was kind of a, like a... Uh, philosophy that she invented. It, it, it was an amazing thing. And it seems to grab kids at college age because it's about, it, it revolves around the importance of self, of serving mm -hmm. yourself, not serving the community, not yeah. serving your company, not working for the man, but self-interest. Yeah. And she dives deep dives into why self-interest is healthy, mm -hmm. which is quite contrary to what's being spun today about, uh, well, in today's memes and in today's society. Yeah. You must, you must have had a sense of that because you put a, together this hell of a TED talk about self-interest. What was your initial foothold in that topic? Well, so it goes back to when I graduated from college. You know, I uh, went to work for the city of Los Angeles 
uh, in, the, in a management trainee program, and they assigned me to uh, the Department of Aging was going to be my initial placement. Working aging, with seniors, like aging, aging like ING? A, yes, people getting older. Okay. And uh, all my coworkers, I learned, were going to be in their 70s. And I'm thinking, man, what a bummer of a department. I'm going to be with all these old people. It's going to be so just kind of depressing. I, I mean, I'll be honest. I, I'm, not, I'm not proud to admit this. I had a lot of biases. And what I found is that my coworkers were super enthusiastic because they were mostly, you know, in their seventies and they were giving back to the community from whence they came. They were giving back to seniors in terms of our Meals on Wheels programs, in terms of community center work. And they were so vibrant. They were more vibrant than some of my friends in their twenties. Yeah. And I saw firsthand how the power of service for them, it wasn't the fountain of youth. They had all the wrinkles and all that stuff. But it was this fountain of energy. And I saw firsthand the power of what serving others can do for the individual. So it really kind of got me to think about things differently. And then I went on later on in life and kind of forgot that lesson. And I was reminded of it um, when I joined the service organization. And then I realized, you know what? We're kind of selling the wrong thing. When we're selling people on, you know, be altruistic, serve others, it's gonna be good for the world. When in fact, it would be a lot more compelling to uh, take the on-ramp approach and say, look, it's gonna be good for you and here's why. Yeah, and uh, that's another thing we have in common, by the way, that address the elephant in the room. We both belong to what I think is the greatest service organization in the world, which is Rotary. I, I agree, I've been a 10 year member, love it. Yeah, so, so in your talk, you, you actually, you know, you bump up against this. I mean, you don't glance up against it, you bump up against it. And I, I so was taken by your approach because a lot of people don't want to talk about it. Here's another example of things we don't like to talk about. There's a meme out right now, it's been popular for five, eight years now, which is, uh, uh, I don't judge, no judgment. Um, I'm not judging you. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's the biggest load of crap I've ever heard. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I use judgment every day, it's specifically good judgment. Yeah, well, yeah. If you do I try judgment, not to use prejudgment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I never utter those words. I'm not judging. Yeah. But judgment That's... has taken like this negative connotation, just like the idea that you wouldn't be uh, uh, practicing servant leadership or you wouldn't be giving back is, uh, is a bad connotation. Yeah. That's the bump, yeah. right? Yeah, it is. So I, I think a lot of people somehow think helping others and saying that you get pleasure out of it or that it helps you, whether physically or mentally, makes it seem like you're doing it for the quid pro quo. And a lot of people who have that service bent and mindset somehow feel like it, it's dirty. It makes them, it kind of lessens the impact of what they're doing um, on the world or even on themselves. So they say, well, you know, I, you know, it's a, just, it's the right thing to do, but they don't reflect and they don't share their story about how it's really helping them, you know? Right. And I think that that's, it's such a missed opportunity because a lot of people need that motivation from someone they know saying, hey, I serve and whether it's Rotary or some other organization or volunteer activity, and here's what, how it benefits me. And they tell their story. Stories, just like kind of getting back to what we talked about with parables, stories are compelling. But if we're not willing to say how that service is helping our own story, we're missing out on an opportunity to attract people into enjoying something that has made our lives a lot better. Yeah, I think too that there's like this interpretation, this open interpretation somehow that, that giving and getting are somehow mutually exclusive. Yes, I agree with that. But I think of it more like, I don't know crap about electricity, but it seems to me like it's a, it's a circuit. It's a closed circuit that that it's going this way and then it's coming this way. It's like um, in uh, in the computer world they call it a ping. Mm -hmm. I would send you a signal, and then the only re reason I know you got the signal is I'm getting something back from you, mm -hmm. and that's how I think about service. I'm getting something back from all of the giving. Yes, I, I think uh, someone, I, I'm guessing you, you might have run across him. I have a lot of respect for him. He's endorsed my books. So that's not why I'm going to quote him here, but he said it quite simply, givers gain. This is Dr. Uh, Ivan Meisner. Of, yeah. uh, no, uh, Ivan Meisner, the founder of Business Networking International. 
Oh. And it's this notion of if you want to build a referral-based business, rather than going out there trying to get referrals, go out there and you give. Yeah. So that's on the professional, the business level, but the same applies when it comes to volunteer service. Yeah. You know, when we give, we gain. And there's nothing wrong to say that. So he captured it in two words, givers gain. I love that. Um, and I think that that's something that the business community has embraced. But for some reason, when it comes to volunteer activities, when it comes to service organizations, for some reason or other, we've been more reluctant to really uh, embrace that mantra. Let's talk about Rotary for just a second as an example. We, we can both speak eloquently about our own organization. But as you said earlier, this applies probably to every service organization. No question. What's happened through the years that has us uh, let me reframe it. I'll, I'll come in another direction. Rotary started in 1905 mm -hmm. uh, during a time of the three P's, policy, procedure, and protocol. Mm -hmm. Today, we live in an exceedingly informal society where those three things are falling away. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't necessarily want a bunch of um, uh, traditional uh, procedural type things to happen when we get together with our mates for lunch. Mm -hmm. This is this is what I'm experiencing when I travel the Rotary Circuit, doing talks and that sort of thing, visiting clubs. Um, how did it become so lopsided that that the give seems so heavy-handed or so onerous, and the get is almost well, it's so obscure that we don't, we don't even talk about it as if it doesn't exist. How did it get that lopsided? You know, I, I, that's, it's a really good question. I've never quite thought about it that way. I think that um, Rotary, and I have friends in other service organizations, it naturally attracts people who really do want to make an impact in their communities, whether yeah. it's local, whether it's global. Um, and I think that because of that, their reasons are pure, and therefore I think their language becomes rather pure. Uh, it's all about the giving, because that just seems like that's in line with kind of their own sort of internal structure, their value system. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's the most effective way to get others aboard the train, whether it's Rotary or whether it's whatever organization you belong to. Yeah, I'm and glad you, you added that last part, because now if we talk about, say, work or yeah. leadership teams or there's a big problem right now keeping people in, on jobs because they feel like they have so many other alternatives or opportunities, you know, the uh, everybody's leaving, retiring early or whatever they're doing. Nobody's really figured out exactly why people aren't hanging around at work. Um, but I, but I think that if, if whatever you're doing, rotary, work, what, if whatever the team thing is, mm -hmm. seems mandatory or onerous or uh, um, heavy lifting, mm -hmm. right? If it's something that you have to do, but mm -hmm. don't necessarily want to do, you're in the wrong zip code. I, I would I, think if you're a leader, you've, that's got to be in your head. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to appeal to people's enlightened self-interest. I yeah. think there is this, this notion that, you know, you attract people by kind of leaning into their altruism. Yeah. When the reality is uh, most people uh, who have social inclination that want to do good also have other things weighing on their time, whether it's family, whether it's professional commitments. Netflix. And you have to you, Netflix, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, Xbox, you know, whatever, pick your, <laughs> pick your passion, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that, that that's really, um, it's, it's more of a positioning thing than anything else. I mean, it's not like you're trying to get them to do something that isn't of service, something that isn't beneficial, whether it's for their community or for their career. But I think we need to do a better job of framing things out in ways that are more compelling to people. Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, I feel sometimes like I'm Don Quixote, you know, pushing. I'm the only guy pushing up against the windmill, trying to educate people on this and, and help fix it. I just took a position as um, lead trainer for the President's Elect Training Seminar, or PETS, as it's known mm -hmm. in the Rotary world, for the Great Lakes region. Strictly volunteer. Uh, I know the guy that's going to be the general chair. He needs help. I think the event could be better. 
Mm -hmm. and, I, and I whispered to him quietly because I didn't know how he was going to take it. I said to him, Jim, wouldn't it be great if we had an event, a training event that was so good that people would stand in line to be president of their Rotary Club just so yeah. they could get the pets training? And, it, and his eyebrows got really big and he got quiet and he goes, that would be amazing. Yes, so that's what we're going to go to work on an event yeah. that you would want to go to not have to go to you would be served because it would be the best training you ever got, including training you got through your vocation, you're going to get now from your avocation. Mm -hmm. And because we treated you so well, and because you had a premier experience, maybe your giving accelerates and amps up in many ways. Yeah, I mean, I think that is sort of the, 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 the ultimate thing to shoot for. Uh, and I don't think <laughs> any service organization really thinks about doing that where it's so compelling that people say, boy, this is not only useful for my giving nature, but for my just professional development. So I, I love that goal. And then back to the work side again, you know, if, if you had a, a career development, professional development happening on the job somehow where you became not just a better employee, but more employable, mm -hmm. where you felt that the company was really, you know, eh, because it's hard to get employees to think about it as a, as a career and not a job. Yeah, it, it's the difference between an owner and an employee. That's right. Um, and the, the key is to always position things in such a way that people can see a more uh, holistic benefit. So, you know, our, our realm is relationship building. So when we pitch a company, the company is picking up the tab. But what gets the employees excited is they say, wow, I'm learning these things that are going to help me connect better with my colleagues and with our customers and with our prospective customers. But these relationship building skills also are going to help me with my spouse, with my right. kids, with people in my community. And I think that's, that's the virtuous circle that, you know, is working for our business is if you can kind of cover a, a broader reach, both the personal and the professional, whether it's training for Rotary or training for anything. Yeah. Um, and people see that the value for them in all facets of their life. I think that's really the sweet spot to aim for. Before we talk about your book titles um, and tell people where they can reach you, Patrick, uh, I wanted to get, uh, and it's probably silly to talk about this because relationships are complicated, but is there a, if you were being interviewed on a, on a game show and it was the speed round and somebody said to you, uh, give us the very best tip you have for improving relationships, across the board. Do you have advice like that or is it too complicated? Uh, you know, <laughs> one of our clients always told, told me his best piece of advice and I loved it so much, I'm gonna share it with you. Uh, and that is stop trying to be the most interesting person in the world, simply be the most interested person. Yeah. Um, and I, I've heard variants of that um, and if you go and look at speakers over the years, but really, I think relationship building, when you can really be with the other person and hear them and not just hear them, but then when you have a conversation, you're leading off of what they just have told you, what their interests are, and just kind of take off your own, you know, these are my priorities. And this is the um, kind of what is motivating the other person. Everybody has an interesting story and an, uh, and, and an interest and just go down that path with them. Um, and you're gonna learn something because if they're really passionate about something, it's gonna open your eyes probably to a different way of looking at things, maybe a brand new reality. And I think the key is just be interested. Don't stop trying to be so interesting and just be interested. There's been a nice little yin and yang in this conversation between self-interest and the interest of others. Yeah, I was at a networking event the other day and somebody literally came up and interrupted a conversation, which isn't a bad thing, because that's somehow sometimes the only way you can get into a conversation is to interrupt. Right. But the interruption was to shove a business card in my hand and the other gentleman's hand and say, uh, here's my card, guys. And they walked away. A blackjack yeah. dealer, right? They had 21 cards to pass out at that event. And that was like card 18. They needed to get rid of it, it right? felt like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So my point is, and I, I know you know this, but just so that other people don't think that we're thinking that, you know, on the scale, you just press all the way to self-interest and you're good. You can go too far in that direction. You need that, you need that sweet spot in the middle there, self-interest tempered by 
interest in others. Yes, for sure. Giving tempered by getting all yes. this back and forth all the time, right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of the favorite stories I love to share with people is when we started our company 20 something odd years, 21 years ago, uh, I joined a chamber of commerce and I went to an event. I had a lot of friends in the room. I was on the board of that chamber. I could have gone to anyone in that room and had a nice conversation. And there was a guy on the outskirts of the crowd whose arms were like that. He didn't look happy to be there. And I walked over to him. I said, great event. He said, are you kidding me? I'd rather be anywhere but here. And I said, well, for instance, where? And he said, at home. And of course, you know, like, well, what would you rather, you know, be doing at home? He was reading a book. Well, what book? And we went on to have this conversation about English literature. He had the stack of books. He had graduated from college. He had the stack of books to read. And it was a great conversation. He was kind of holding forth at this monologue. And they said, hey, Patrick, the shrimp are running out. I need to take off. And I didn't know what was going on. He went into the kitchen, grabbed out this platter of shrimp. He was the banquet manager. And he said, look, I don't have time to talk. I never asked, what do you do? And I said, you know, we have a PR company. That's what we were when we started. Yeah. And he introduced us to the GM of that hotel. They became our first major client. Uh, that went on to be an introduction to our two next clients over a conversation about English literature, his thing, not my thing. And just genuinely being interested in asking them questions. So we never know, you know, where a great professional relationship is going to start, where a great personal relationship is going to start. But the key for that was just, just being interested in what the guy had to share. Yeah, bravo. Good job. Yeah, yeah. it was just a, a fun, a good example of, you know, how you bring it to life. Let's talk about your books, man, and how people can get them. Excellent. Yeah, first book, The Connector's Way, uh, it came out. I'll hold it up since we're on YouTube here. Uh, the Connector's Way came out in uh, 2016. Uh, second book, The Trusted Way, came out in 2021. They're both parables. There are some characters who go from book one into book two. Uh, the first book is about how you build relationships uh, one person at a time. There's seven essential rules I'm sharing. The second one, I realized that people who try to build relationships as an activity who don't have a foundation of trust, uh, they get stuck and they can get into some problems. So I wanted to do a separate book about trust. Yeah, lovely. Uh, how, pe how can people order the books? Uh, if they go to my website, patrickdalvin.com, there's a book section there. Uh, so they can order direct from us or they can go to Amazon. They're available print Kindle on Amazon, Audible on Amazon for the Connector's Way, audio uh, on my website for the Trusted Way. Great. And we'll drop a couple of these links into the uh, video description and also the podcast description so people can click there and, and order up. Remind me what part of the world you live in. I am in beautiful Portland, Oregon. All right. Portland's wonderful. That's where Renee's from, by the way. Is it really? Yeah, Portland is great. This time of year, we're kind of thinking mm, some more sun and warmth would be good. But all of the rain uh, keeps things green. And if we had less rain, we'd basically be an extension of California. We don't want that. Nothing against Californians, but we've got a little bit more wide open spaces up here. Well, it's been a delight talking with you today. You've got so much good stuff going on. I wish you the best of luck with the book tour and all things galvanizing. And uh, <laughs> let's do more together, okay? Yeah, look forward to it. I hope to see you at the convention in, uh, in June in, in Houston. Patrick's referencing the Rotary International Convention, which moves around uh, every year. Um, I think it's in Australia coming up. It was supposed to be in Taiwan last year, but we're all looking forward to some face-to-face -face time in, in Houston in June. I look forward to that as well. Excellent, Michael. Thank you for Thank your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir.